So today we're going to kind of talk about butterflies, which I think everybody kind of gardens for different reasons, and I tend to garden for butterflies. Um, I've named my house after butterflies, so hopefully we'll get some butterflies here soon. Um, we're going to start pretty simply with the life cycle of a butterfly. So um, it starts with the egg, and oops, let me go back the other way. So as you can see here, there's a little tiny egg coming out of the bottom of this uh, butterfly. Um, and these are, these are the tips of the leaves. So these are much, much magnified in, your, in this picture of a, of a very pristine little uh, butterfly egg or caterpillar egg. Um, it's one of those things that you, you may not see out there. They're usually laid singly along the leaf stems. Um, on the on the tips of the leaves. Sometimes they're even on stalks so they don't get eaten by predators. Um, but it, just a few days after they um, are laid, they start to hatch. And this is a baby, a baby caterpillar, even a small teeny tiny caterpillar. And they're very teeny tiny. Um, some of them are less than a quarter of an inch long when they hatch out. Um, but basically a caterpillar is a head, a mouth, and a stomach. So what they do is they eat and they feed and they feed and they eat and eat and eat and they grow. So here are some different styles of caterpillars. You can see this is a, a spotted wing, uh, spotted skipper caterpillar. It's fairly large. It's one of the later, we call them instars. So as they hatch and they eat and grow and then they have to shed their skin, when they shed their skin, they're then considered an, that's an instar. So some of them have two or three or four instars. Um, these over here, the spice fish swallowtail goes from looking like a piece of bird poop, um, which is a which is a predatory, um, it, I guess it's a mimic of bird poop so that they don't get eaten by other predators. Um, and then they become these beautiful um, caterpillars with these eye spots on the back, which are kind of fun. And those are just for to scare away caterpillars or eaters, birds, um, frogs, and things like that that would love it nice juicy caterpillar to eat. Um, here's a twin spotted stink. Um, and we would mostly call that a hornworm, a tomato or a tobacco hornworm. Um, and then we've got some fuzzy caterpillars. So we have our woolly bear, which is um, the indicator of how bad our winters are gonna be. This one doesn't look too bad. Um, we've got a tussock moth, which is one of our native oak feeders. Um, for us, and then the saddleback caterpillar. Um, and this one is kind of um, venomous. Um, if you brush up against some of these um, hairs along the outside or along the top, they will kind of leave the hairs in and it'll, it'll feel like a burning stinging sensation. So sometimes they're the stinging caterpillars. And those are usually marked with some really bright colored um, colorings on them so you know that they're dangerous to be around. Those, uh, the saddlebacks you can find in some of the cornfields. And if you're walking through the cornfield, you can just definitely get stung by one of those. Oh, there's my little gift from such a list of other things for that one. So feeding, oh, let me turn this stuff back in. So feeding, they do, they do feed. So if you're gonna garden for the butterflies, know that. Um, you will find leaves that are chewed. They'll be half eaten. There'll be, uh, there'll be holes in them. Um, but you need the caterpillars to get the butterflies later. Um, so this caterpillar is going to it. He's, he or she is just eating and they will eat from the outside of the leaf to the midrib. So all you may see is the rib of, the, of that leaf left. That's how you know you've got caterpillars. Um, then they molt, so they eat and they molt. Um, this one has just hatched out of this one, which just hatched. And then it feeds for a while and then it turns in, this is a, one of those uh, swallowtail butterflies. And then it turns into this one and it's only about, oh, 10 millimeters long, maybe a centimeter. I think that's a centimeter. Nope, that's a hundred, well, I don't know. It's no math Wednesdays for me. So um, they're about that long. They're pretty good. They're still eating just little tiny holes in their leaves. And then when they get bigger, you can see that one's probably an inch or two long. Um, this is the tail end. If you've ever seen a swallowtail butterfly larvae caterpillar, um, if you startle it, its little back end comes up and it blows air into some sacs underneath theirs and those eyes get really big. 
and whatever's attacking it gets startled because of the eye spot and it will leave it alone. Hopefully, that's the goal anyway for that. So after they have become full size and they're ready to go to the next stage, they tend to pupate in a crystal. Um, this is a monarch butterfly. Oops, sorry. This is a no way. Monarch butterfly. So they usually hang from a, a limb. This happens to be in a in a plastic cup, but they'll hang from the top, and then they'll kind of come into this J shape. And basically, what they do is they take that outer skin and they make themselves a chrysalis or an outer casing. In some um, some moths and butterfly species, this will be more. Um, cocoon-like, it may be made out of silk, it may be something that will overwinter with. Um, the monarchs tend not to overwinter as chrysalises. Chrysalis, chrysalis. Um, and then they'll, they'll, they'll stay inside the, their chrysalis for a determined period of time, depending on the species. And then they will um, basically turn their whole body into goo and reform it into the butterfly shape, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, so this is a complete metamorphosis. So this is a swallowtail. As you can see, they kind of put a few different threads. You see the threads here to hang from. This is their um, head end, their head end. Um, and they kind of hang from a leaf or a branch. And then they make this really pretty leaf-shaped chrysalis. And then as, as they age and mature, it kind of becomes more clear. And they then become a butterfly. So when they're ready to emerge, they will look like um, a butterfly, but they will hang upside down. And as you can see on this monarch, this orange one over here, their abdomen are pretty swollen. That's where a lot of the extra fluids go when they more metamorphosize. Um, and as they hang upside down, they use that their abdomen muscles to pump fluid into the veins of their wings. And they will fill these wings with fluid to kind of open them up. It's kind of like a, an umbrella that they kind of unfold and um, stiffen up with those uh, veins on there. Um, and that allows them to be stiff enough for them to fly later on. So the goal of the butterfly is to mate and, and lay eggs, or at least for the females to lay eggs. So mating happens fairly quickly. Um, they can usually find each other through pheromones. Um, and usually the um, female is a little bigger than the male. Usually, she needs a little bit more um, energy um, to lay those eggs with. So mating happens. Dot dot dot. Um, and then they they then the cycle starts over. Um, so usually the males and females are the same color. Um, sometimes they're not. So you'll have to look at some of your books. There's some really good um, field guides out there for butterflies out there, and we'll talk about some resources later on. But we also talk about gardening. We love gardening. Um, so there's some la basic landscaping principles um, that you want to use when you're talking about um, butterflies, or at least attracting the butterflies, is you want to minimize your lawn. Um, the lawn is pretty monochromatic. It doesn't have a lot of food for them, depending on the species, and we can talk about this later. Um, some, some butterflies feed, some, some of them don't. So you need to minimize the lawn to kind of to maximize the flower potential. Um, we're going to plant diversely and densely. Even though it, the butterflies have um, multifaceted eyes, they don't see color very well. So you have to put the colors all together. Having one little flower in a sea of green is going to be really hard for those butterflies to see. Um, it also provides a dense cover and protects them from um, uh, predators. You can use feeders or nest boxes to supplement natural foods and covers. Although the nest boxes are usually not good for butterflies because the wasps will get in there and it'll just be a mess. So usually we're looking at feeders and we'll show some feeders later on. And then you wanna use um, some of your native plant communities in your landscape as your model for your landscape. So if you live in central Kentucky, we had um, pretty much uh, tall grass prairie or short, yeah, tall grass prairie. If you live closer to the bluegrass, you may have a mesomit forest. And if you're in Western Kentucky, you've also had a lot of um, tall grass prairies with some, um, depending on if you're closer to the rivers, um, you may have had some other landscapes in there too. And then strive for diversity. We want things to be um, diverse. So you, 
what I think about with butterflies is they have to land on something. So you want some of these daisy-like flowers like you see in this picture, but some of them also hang. So you may need something like a, a tubular flower for them to put their little crosses in and drink the nectar. So that you're looking at a couple of different things, but the one thing that butterflies do need is some type of liquid nourishment. They're not gonna be pollinators per se um, to eat the pollen. They're really gonna be more um, drinking the nectar of those flowers. So our goal in making our garden is we're gonna plant flowers for every season. So that means um, you want to plant something that blooms early in the spring to late into the fall. So in the early spring, you may be doing um, daffodils and um, oh, bluebells and early, early blooming things, you know, all those things, the daisies, some of those daisies for them to land on. In the summer, you're looking at, um, this is butterfly milkweed and, and goldenrod and all of these, um, the, the sunflowers and pixies and things of that sort. Um, and then in the fall, you can do something like the goldenrod. They have a really good nectar source. Um, even a lot of the asters will um, be fine for um, those late season things. So things that bloom late into the fall will also help some of those uh, late developing uh, butterflies. Because this year, we kind of got a little crazy with our weather and things have been a little bit delayed. Um, I would also kind of stress, kind of a, if you're going to really go for the, the gusto, avoid some of the modern hybrids. Not to say that you can't have them in your garden, they're perfectly fine, but sometimes those double flowers um, trade off petals instead of having nectar glands. Um, I just learned this in my class this last semester, is that when you double a flower like this um, echinacea over here, it takes what would be the seeds in the normal flower and it makes them into petal petal parts and those petal parts don't necessarily have a lot of the nectar that those um, butterflies are looking for so avoid the modern hybrids um you can have some named varieties which are perfectly fine and if you look on the left oops, sorry I didn't mean to keep that um you're too far hold on okay on the left here this is um the endangered um echinacea Tennesseeensis, which they then took out of, they took some seeds and they named it Rocky Top, and now they sell it. Um, and it's Tennessee Coneflower, which used to be in danger. It's probably still in danger where it normally is, but they've actually gotten this plant out of the endangered species list and put it into the study because they could then propagate that and have it um, in the garden. I have, some, I have this in my garden and it's wonderful. It's usually pretty cold with butterflies when it starts to bloom here in another four or five weeks. Okay, so if you're, look, um, if you're looking for some ways to attract and you don't have enough flowers, you can create what they call a salt lick for butterflies and, and bees. Bees will come to it too because it's salty and sweet. Um, you can use just this little plastic dish. Um, usually something that's bright colored, like a yellow or a red will be good. This is one of those like little scrubbies that you can get for your dishes. And they have put a, a a little bit of table salt or sea salt um, in there with a little bit of um, real sugar soda, and that will kind of attract them. You could use honey if you wanted to, um, but both of these are kind of salt licks in, in places. This is what they call puddling. These are male clouded sulfur butterflies, and they don't really feed on nectar, but they feed on mud. So if you have a muddy place, that's kind of in the sun in your garden, you can put these little basking rocks out there and they will bask and warm up on a sunny day. And then if this is moist and wet, they will then um, lick or sip the salt out of the soil and it kind of makes them a little bit more robust. It kind of gives them a power drink energy and they will um, then be able to mate a little bit more efficiently. Um, so those are the, that's, that's called a male puddling pond. But you can make one of those with a saucer and some sand, a little bit of sugar water, a little bit of salt, and you should be good to go with that. So salt looks are a way you can add, add a little bit of color to your garden without actually planting some plants. The other thing I want to stress is to reduce your pesticides. Um, 
handpicking, now granted, these are sphinx moth larvae, what we're going to call them. If they were on your tomato plants, we'd call them tomato hornworms. Um, we don't necessarily want them in the vegetable garden. But, so if you can pull them out by hand, that's great. Although I don't see any that have any of the little parasitic wasps on them. Those I would leave. Um, but those are easy to do instead of spraying. Um, if you do spray, do the, the, you know, the least toxic that you can, but again, you're wanting the caterpillars to be there. Um, I did have a lady call and she was kind of upset. She had this beautiful butterfly garden put in. Um, she's like, well, where are all the butterflies? I said, well, what'd you do? She goes, well, I had all these caterpillars, so I sprayed and killed them all. I'm like, well, you just killed all of the butterflies. So she didn't make the connection that she needed the caterpillars and the plants can handle the demons. It's not something that they're gonna, they're, it's gonna be surprising for them to have. Um, this little swallowtail over here, oh, sorry, that's a monarch, sorry, uh, monarch butterfly on a milkweed. The milkweeds kind of evolved around the, the monarchs, so they kind of do very well together and a little bit of feeding on your, your milkweed is not gonna be a problem for, the, for those plants. Um, and then think about sometimes their har the larval host plants. I do have a list at the end that I'll share with you all, um, but it includes what the, the larvae eat or the caterpillars eat. Because sometimes you, you'll have the, the adults, but you won't, you won't, they'll just kind of come through and be there and then they'll go away. Um, so you may need to add, instead of adding dill for the swallowtail butterflies, you may need to add pussy willow to your garden because that's what some of those larvae eat. Um, passion flower, there's a specific caterpillar that eats um, maypops or passion flower vine. Um, and some of that damage is tolerated. Don't worry about that. Um, but you know, you may have to plant some shrubs and trees um, to get uh, some, some of those special butterflies. I have a pipe vine in my garden because I want to attract the pipe vine swallowtail. I also have um, Pass the press in there so I can attract some other kind of butterflies in there. So, so it may not just be the flowering plants that we think of that we need to add to our garden. So how can we do this? Um, you can turn your lawn into a meadow. Um, there, are, there are lots of different kinds of meadows depending on where you live. Um, in E-Town, everything has to be about 10 inches or less. Um, and if you leave a little bit of space and let people know what you're doing, I think they're usually okay with that. Um, so that might be something for you to do is to turn your lawn into a meadow. Um, if that's not feasible for you, um, you can definitely have clumps of meadow-like meadow -like areas um, where you have large swaths of one or two different species in your, in your garden is what I'm gonna call it in your yard. Um, and then if you really can't do anything like that, spice up the lawn. There's lots of things that you can put in your lawn. <laughs> that's not grass, that's not tall fence or blue grass, but the blue-eyed grasses, which you see right here, they bloom a little bit, um, they're, actually they're blooming right now, but they will bloom um, and they'll be shorter than the mowing height of your grass. There's a lot of violets. I have a lot of violets in my yard. I don't have a problem with them taking them out if I need to, but um, there's actually a couple of um, native butterflies that love to eat the violet leaves. Um, spring beauties, there's speedwells, um, chickweed. As much as we hate them in our perfect lawns, they're great if you're trying to get a more diverse lawn in your, uh, in your front yard, or you can use your backyard. So adding things into the lawn is okay. Um, there's other food sources. Um, some like uh, unsavory food stuff, this is what they call it. Um, so they feed on other things other than nectar. So animal droppings, you might find some um, butterflies land on those. Urine, rotting fruit. Um, some of them like overripe bananas, oranges, or a sponge with some lightly salted water that we talked about earlier in our, in our puddling. Um, and they'll see, see what butterflies come to investigate. Um, but if you use sea salt um, rather than regular table salt, sometimes that sea salt has a different range of micronutrients in there. Um, and since sea salt's are pretty um, easily found everywhere, I would use that as opposed to regular table salt um, on there. But you can use, this is just one of those little, um, oh gosh, um, 
three tier banana bins um, that people have in their kitchens that they filled with bananas. Um, if you've got some rotting manure, I don't know that I would hang it up, um, but you can see what comes into that. Um, and then don't disturb the butterflies, they're feeding. Um, and this is actually in a butterfly house where they have fed them with oranges and, and bananas um, that are on the, on the ripening end. Sometimes orange juice works also as well as part of that puddle. Um, cover, where do the butterfly goes when it rains? Usually they go underneath a leaf or they're, they're on the bark of the tree. Um, natural cavities, um, although I have put some photos of some butterfly houses here, they really don't use those very often um, that I have found. And I have to keep the wasps out of them because the wasps like them for um, their nests and their uh, shelters too. So there's lots of things that, that can cover. If you've got a lot of leaf litter, especially over winter, some of those butterflies over winter as adults, they will be tucked into the leaf litter so that you they will overwinter there. Um, but these fallen logs um, in your mulch, um, if you've got a sunny log or a sunny rock, they can be used as basking sites. Um, and they'll, because they're cold natured or they're ambient temperature uh, insects, then they will need to warm up in the sometime so they can get around. Water, um, misters, um, sponges with a little bit of water. Um, I use a little bit of uh, a saucer with some sand and keep that kind of full of water. It also feeds, it also waters the bees that we have. Um, so damp soil or, or um, damp sand will also be a way for them to get water. But they mostly get most of their nutrients. If they feed nectar, they feed, they'll feed on nectar. Um, but if they're those male uh, clotted sulfurs, they tend to puddle in the, in the mud. So we're gonna kind of talk about some, what we need to put in our garden plan. Um, our garden plan is pretty simple. We're gonna try, we're gonna start with some food. Food can be plants, food's great. We're gonna have some cover. Um, so that might just be leaving some of those um, gardens untended in the fall. Leave those sticks, leave those leaves up so that they can find a place to overwinter. Um, water, sometimes it's just a damp leaf. That's all I need. Mean. Um, you need some basking sites, so some open areas with some sun. Uh, visibility, they want to see what's coming after us, if there's something coming after us for that. Um, and I've got a couple of plans here. So here's a, here's a pretty small um, butterfly garden. Um, it's got some large and small shrubs and some native grasses because they also get fed on by uh, caterpillars. Um, there's a little drip pool, so it's just water. There's some, you can see the list over here. There's asters and blazing stars and coreopsis. But if you've noticed in the plan, they've grouped the colors together. So you've got the yellows with the yellows and the purples with the purples and the reds with the reds. Um, and it has a good succession of plants from, there's, from summer through fall. You could add some other things in here. The downy phlox is a little bit um, early. You're looking at some of the um, annuals can be kind of early. Um, that will give you, and the annuals will give you color all season long. So the hard part is scheduling the perennials, um, but the annuals will give you kind of a backup. So if you're just starting out with the butterfly garden, stick with some annuals because they'll give you color for a long period of time. And then pull in the perennials as you get more uh, used to scheduling those kinds of things. Okay, here's the butterfly garden. And here's a sample. Now this is a fancy plan. Um, the fancy plan um, for uh, a backyard. So here's the house at the bottom. And they've got, oh, some large trees, small trees, some evergreens. Um, they've got a meadow, which is in the middle, kind of uh, surrounded by trees a little bit. They've got flowering and fruit trees. That's also a, a place for those butterflies to, to feed from. There's a hummingbird garden up by the house, and there's a pond and a bridge. So this is just kind of a basic layout of what they want to attract. Um, but it shows all the permanent features. It shows um, how it's used by wildlife. You can put whatever you want on your plant. Um, and, Mine are just circles, basically. Um, I don't have to get this one for a plan. So how do you want your garden to look? What, what should your garden look like? Well, it should be you. It should be something that you like to handle. Um, this is a wonderful butterfly garden. Um, 
and I think it's actually a public garden that has a little bit of a um, greenhouse component to it. Um, so yeah, there might be some greenhouses in there, but it's got some trees and some shrubs and it's got a lot of plants. So does your garden look like this? Is this your front yard? I wish this was my front yard, it is not. Here's another front yard that's pretty um, showy. It's got a lot of different um, shapes and sizes of plant material. So you've got like the daisy-like blanket flowers. Um, I think those are some, um, lots of gloriosa or uh, daisies, rebecchias. Um, there's the pink cosmos. And I think back here in the middle, there's a vegetable garden. So um, just be careful with those cabbage leaguers. They do like to eat the cabbage a lot. Um, here's a more public garden. Oh, well, that one's kind of fuzzy. You all can see that. Here's another one. Um, this one's got some Baptisia that blooms. Here's a lot of yarrow, I believe, in the front. Um, and this one's just starting to come into bloom. And then you've got your, your typical daisies, shafted daisies, your um, Rebecca's. I think there's some Kiyomi. This is actually in E Town at the Pritchard Community Center. This is their butterfly garden. Um, and that is just, it's mostly perennials um, that come back every year. So there's some roses, there's some plots, um, there's some trees and shrubs in the background. There's a little creek that runs back behind there. Um, and this changes every year. So you'll have to um, come back and see us every year. So they're like, what kind of plants do I need to plant? Um, here are the plants. Amsonia, this one's really kind of nice. If these are, most of them get about two to three feet tall. So um, if, they, if there's some other interesting, uh, I won't go through the whole cultural um, things, just know that these are mostly perennials. Um, this one has some really good fall color and it blooms fairly early. This one blooms for us about in Central Kentucky about um, the beginning of May. Um, but it's, and it has these light blue flowers. There's several varieties of uh, species of Amsonia. So kind of find one that's close to you. Asters are great. Um, they can get from three to six feet tall and they bloom late. So they bloom from August to about October. Um, and they come in pinks, purples, and they're sometimes they're blue, um, but they're mostly a bluish purple color. Um, and they're really tolerant. Um, I like asters. They're kind of that last of the season hurrah for us, um, and there's a lot, there's a lot of um, native butterflies or caterpillars that feed on these. Baptisia, one of my favorites. It comes in a couple of different colors. There's the blue one that we all like. There's a white. There's also a yellow um, that's native to our area. So, um, and they're all different species. So go ahead and uh, plant Baptisia. This plant gets fairly large though. It'll get about three to four feet tall with all those um, flower spikes on them. Black Eyed Susan, there's several varieties, um, several species. Um, you've got the, the typical flat um, nose variety, what they're called flat. And this one's a tall one. I don't remember what species the tall one is, but it's, it's a, I think it's a native to Missouri, um, but it's a native to the tall grass Missouri. Um, and they're fun. And, and, the, and if you don't even have the butterflies, the birds will eat the seeds. So that's another wildlife to pick on there. Blazing Star, easy to grow. They come in a bowl. They're easy to plant. Um, they do get fairly tall, and if they're kind of in rich soil, they tend to flop over. So don't feed them. Um, they don't need it. Here's some bush clover. Um, not only does it look good in flower, it also looks good in seed or in the winter time. So you'll have some winter interest. I always have a hard time in my perennial garden getting some winter interest. And we all know about butterfly weed. Um, the, this is the orange one. Um, as opposed to milkweed, which is the pink one. Um, very hard to transplant if you're transplanting it out of the garden somewhere else. Um, I would start these from seed or get them in a container um, as they're growing before you um, transplant them. They like to be transplanted. Um, here's, um, sometimes people call this bush clover, but I think it's really kind of cool looking plant. And the cool thing about this is that it flowers from the base of the flower to the top, which is normally it. I don't know, just do things normally go from the top to the bottom, but I think it looks like it's got a little pink tukey or purple tukey around it. Um, compass plant um, usually has a really good uh, reputation. It, it can get fairly tall, so be careful with it. Um, 
but I like the yellow flower. I like yellow flowers. Um, there's lots of cone flowers. There's lots of native cone flowers. Um, there's the purples and the yellows. So be careful with some of the other colors that you find out there. Um, they could be bred and not, not be bred for um, the nectar production. Cup plant. This one kind of does double duty. Not only does it have these beautiful yellow flowers, but it also, the leaves hold a little bit of water around the stem. Um, so you might see butterflies or frogs or something else kind of taking that uh, water out of those cups. And they bloom late. This one blooms July to September, but it can get eight feet tall. So be careful where you place this one. Um, let's see, cup plant. Oh, golden rods. Golden rods are awesome plants, and every garden needs at least one golden rod, but not the common golden rod. There's lots of them out there. Um, there's the zigzag golden rod. There's the narrow leaf golden rod. Um, there's one called fireworks that's beautiful in a garden situation that's more upright. Um, so yeah, there's all, there's all sorts of them, so pick your favorite. Um, and some of these um, native plant nurseries will have a lot. And they're easy to start from seed, to tell you the truth. Um, I, you know, golden rods go really well with iron weeds. Um, these are purple. I love the yellow purple combination. And there's lots of iron weeds out there. I didn't realize how many there were. And they range from three to six feet tall, depending on the species. Um, some of these iron weeds like a little bit of wetter soil. So if you have a downspout or someplace that gets a little more smushy, especially with all this rain we've had since in a while. Um, you might be planting some iron weeds because they're, they're a really cool plant and they do attract a lot of butterflies. Um, it tends to bloom a little later in August and September. Now, make note of this one, jewel weed is an annual. Um, it is not a perennial, but it will reseed itself if it likes where it's at. Um, jewel weed is, as you know, it looks, it, it is impatient. So an impatient, I know it's, that's weird, but it's also called touch me not. Um, and kids love this plant because when the seeds are ripe and you touch them, they look like these little, here's, here's one of the seed pods, not quite ripe yet, but when you touch it, it springs apart and the seeds go flying. Um, and you can have jewelry just about anywhere. Um, fairly easy to grow from seed, it's an annual, um, but hummingbirds and butterflies love this plant because it does have that tubular shape. And there's a nectar, nectary right there in the back of that um, flower. And some of them you can see have a little piece at the back. And in Kentucky, we have uh, both the orange and the yellow varieties. I don't think they're different species. Um, I just think that they're different um, varieties of the same plant. I could be wrong, I'm not in charge of that. Um, another one good one is Joe Pie Weed. Butterflies love this one. Um, it does, again, July to September. It's that mauvey purple. You'll see it in the fields um, because the cows don't like to eat it. Um, but um, it also will tolerate some wet soil um, for you if you've got a wetter spot. There is a smaller variety called Joe, Little Joe. And I think there's one even smaller than that called Tiny Joe. Don't quote me on that. Um, but there are some that don't get quite as tall as, you know, six to eight feet. Um, Little Joe for me gets about three to four. And it's planted at the bottom, at the base of my downspout. So if you have a little bit, oh, par partial shade, Meadow Rue does a really good job. Um, lots of little tiny flowers that the, those butterflies can hold on to. Um, it doesn't like, it doesn't like the heat and humidity. So if, you, if you've got a more sunny location, put it a little bit of shade. Um, milkweeds are pretty easy. Um, we all love our milkweeds, and some are more suited to the garden than others. Um, there's a swamp milkweed that can take over the world. Um, common milkweed is pretty good, um, but you all want to diversify your milkweeds out. Um, a lot of the monarch way stations that they say, they put too many, um, they only have milkweed, and they don't have a lot of diversifying other plants. And they have, and University UK has actually done a study that says if you only have milkweed in your monarch way station, then there are wasps that come and they pick off all the caterpillars and, and feed them to their young. Um, so basically a monarch way station, if you only have milkweed, will um, be a really good 
uh, feeding station for some of the um, wasps that we have out there in the world. Um, so by mixing it up a little bit and having some milkweed, but not totally all milkweed, um, you'll kind of confuse those predators a little bit better. Um, little tidbit of information. Um, Missouri primrose, these have huge flowers, but they don't get very tall. About a foot tall, about a foot and a half spread. Awesome color. Um, bloom in May to August. They bloom for a long period of time. Um, and they tend to be a, um, they are a larval food source for one of our native um, caterpillars. Blue mist flower, again, blooms late, July to October. Um, this one will tolerate some partial shade. So it's pretty good. Um, it's one of our native plants. It's pretty, I don't like it. Um, bee balm. You may have a love-hate relationship with bee balm, but I can tell you, the bees love it, but the butterflies do too, because they can get their little proboscis in there and drink all that nectar. Again, you're looking for some um, non-named varieties. You can get the, the wild bergamot, you can get the wild bee balm. Um, they'll tolerate dry, they'll tolerate a little bit of wet, they'll, they, they pretty much go everywhere. If you think it's gonna to run around on you, um, plant it in a open bottom pot. New Jersey pea, mm, it's a deciduous shrub, but I threw it in here because it really does um, attract the, the hummingbirds and the butterflies um, for you. And it's fragrant, it's a beautiful plant. It's a, it's a small plant, it, a small shrub, it only gets about four feet tall. Um, but definitely does a really good uh, job for us attracting the butterflies. Passion flower, did you know this one was native as much as it looks tropical? Um, this one's pretty easy to grow. Um, the fruit are edible, but you kind of have to be really hungry to eat them. They don't taste like much, um, but they do have that gorgeous flower and the uh, butterflies do really like it. Plantain, you're like, Amy, this is not a wild flower, but no, but the but there are some um, caterpillars that do feed on the plantain leaves um, and that's their only food source. So I leave mine, but the picture of my yard. And actually that's not the only weed I have in my grass. Um, but yeah, plantains are one of those things that you could leave in your, in your yard to feed the butterflies. Um, and grasses are pretty important um, just as a cover. Um, this is one of my favorite scurry drop seed because it looks nice in the garden. Um, but it also kind of gives you that swaying effect with good fall color on it. Quinine, wild quinine is a beautiful white flower on it. Um, it's also a good cut flower if you would like to bring it in, um, but it also attracts butterflies and it's fragrant. Um, but I wouldn't suggest eating it if you have malaria. There's some better uh, treatments for that. Our native rose mallows, um, they tend to like wet feet. So if you've got a wet spot, you can have this tropical looking plant in your yard. Um, does attract a lot of butterflies because there's a lot of nectar on that um, plant in that flower. Um, rattlesnake nectar is kind of one of those, I'm not sure this is a real plant, it is. Um, it blooms from June to September. It has these kind of ball shaped um, flower heads on it and they each one of those little tiny flowers has nectar in it for those butterflies. Um, but it's, it's also kind of gives you a, structure into the garden and it looks kind of like yucca. That's why it's yucca folium on the base because it does look like a yucca plant, but much easier to remove if you just remove it for yucca. Blue sage, um, very nice, gives you that blue color in the garden. Um, easy to grow. I don't know, I just like the blue. You can see the bees on it. Um, sunflowers, there's lots of per uh, perennial sunflowers in the world. This one just happens to be a taller one at six feet. Um, it likes the open woodland. Another one of mine is Kitty's Weed, Helenium. Um, there's the regular Helenium with the yellow centers. And then this one's called purple-headed sneezeweed. Um, and the reason it was sneezeweed is because they used to, to grind up the flowers as a, uh, use as snuff have been dried and used as snuff. So yeah, not something we do this year, this in this day and age. But uh, switchgrass, another grass, this one has some good fall color to it. Um, but it'll also give you some structure and it'll give you places for those butterflies to hide um, when it gets wet. Cheesewort, one of our um, native 
shady plants that are very um, common to uh, a lot of the woodlands and they will be fed upon by a lot of uh, butterfly caterpillars. Blue Ravain, another tall one. I just realized we've got a lot. This is the last perennial. Um, and this one likes wet meadows. So if you have a wet area, some of the swales or some of the downspouts, Blue Ravain goes pretty good for you. Now, there's another, um, there's a good guide um, and it's in the um, resources list, which is next. Um, that we can do. Um, Louisville did a really good job of, of kind of doing a source guide for all of this. And they had this native plants list. Um, it's pretty um, complete, I would think. It's, there, it's huge, but there's a list in the resources. So um, we have lots of gardening for pollinators. We have attracting pollinators and using native plants. Um, both of those are USDA um, or fe the federal US. Forest Service publications, really good stuff. There, um, native plants for your backyard list by region. So we are in the southeast region of of southeast region of that. Um, there's a lot of bees. There's pollinator meadows, butterflies and pollinators. Now, if you really want a life list of butterflies, go to the Butterflies and Moths of North America, and you can download a life list of all the butterflies that were have been seen in your county that have been posted. So there's the clouded sulfur, which we talked about a little earlier. They do a lot of um, puddling. Um, and you can find a lot of this, but I really wanted to list some of the larval host plants and then the adult host plants, because most of the time they're different. Um, so you see that the senna's and the partridge peas are the larvae, you know, the caterpillars will eat, and then anything with a flower is usually what the clouded sulfur will do. Cabbage white, not necessarily native, but they've been imported. Um, so they'll feed on cabbage families. Um, and this is what your cabbage will look like um, when, when you get these cabbage whites on there. And they're pretty much the same color as the cabbage. Um, here's the great spangled fritillary. Um, they like violets. That's where I was getting the violets from. So if you've got violets in your yard, you've got fritillaries. Um, and they like black eyed Susan for their um, meals as an adult. The gray hair streak, hair streak, sorry, likes the oaks. Um, so if you've got um, oaks on there, and they like the inkberry for adults. Um, and th this is one of those symbiotic relationships where the ants will harvest the um, ex excrement of the of the caterpillars and feed on that. So they'll kind of move those caterpillars around. Um, it, like cows and harvest those out of there. Okay. Um, the eastern tail blue, you're starting to see those right now, but they usually feed on some of the beans and peas and the legumes that you'll find out in your like clovers. Um, American snouts are kind of fun because of their snouts. I love their snouts. Um, but they feed on dogbane and dogwood, goldenrod, sweet pepper bush, um, all sorts of things. The viceroy, does everybody know how to tell the viceroy from the monarch? The viceroy has a V in black on the back of their wings, mostly. But they, their larvae feed on willows, poplars, and cottonwoods, which is kind of fun. And the adults, and, and this is what their larvae look like. They look like a piece of bark hoop. So they're kind of camouflaged. Um, but if you notice, the viceroys will also feed on carrion, dung, fungi, and flower nectar. So you, they're pretty indiscriminate feeders, I think. Honeydew, aphid honeydew, um, especially up in the tops of trees. You'll see them up there flying around. The question mark, um, and it's not because, you know, the caterpillar looks like a little question mark. The question mark is right here on the wing. Can y'all see that um, on the wing? But they like elm, hackberries, and nettles. So you'll see those up into the top of the trees. And these, this adult will feast on rotting fruit and tree sap. And carrion, you know, if you've got a, you know, a dead deer on the side of the road, you might attract some butterflies. Um, zebra solitaires, I haven't seen any yet, but I don't have very many pawpaws around for the, um, for the, the larvae to feed on. Um, and they do field a lot from blueberries. Um, the adults are out early, because um, if they're feeding on blueberries, like the red buds, I have a feeling that they overwinter as adults. 
painted ladies, you can actually buy painted ladies and, and release them yourself um, because they'll feed on just about anything, as you see. And the, but the butterfly only feeds on nectar composite flowers. So your, da your daisies, your sunflowers and things like that from three to six feet tall. That's it, that's where they fly. So if you don't have that niche, you're not gonna get any painted ladies. Now this is the American painted lady, which is a little bit different. They feed on a little bit later uh, blooming plants. Oops, I don't know how that happened. Um, the nectar and the goldenrod and the milkweed. So they're adults are later on in the summer time. Black swallowtail. These are the ones, if you plant one dill plant, you will have these butterflies in your yard. Promise you. Um, they also feed on carrot and canned lace. And they love uh, a lot of the uh, host the, the butterfly weed, the milkweed, the, the flock. You'll see these a lot with the um, monarchs in there. Here's common buckeye. See these a lot. They're pretty um, common out there. Eastern commas. Let me see if I, oh, here's the comma. Kind of looks like a part of a, uh, a question mark. Again, rotting fruit, sap, and nectar in your. And I, I like the fact that this one looks like a piece of a leaf until it opens up and then you see the orange. Kind of surprising, you're like, oh, that's a leaf. No, it's not. Eastern tiger swallowtail is very common in my area at least. Um, although probably not, the larvae are not feeding on ash, but they're pretty pretty easy to find on spice bush and hornbeam and cherry and willow. Um, and you can see them a lot at this time of year. Now this is a moth. I had to throw this one in because it's part of the butterflies and moths. Um, it's actually a clear wing moth and you can see through these wings and it's a bee mimic. So you'll see these they'll and they hum. They sound like bees, but they'll, they'll hover in front of the flowers. Um, and if you see this poor, this is what the larvae look like or the caterpillars, but this one is not going to turn into a butterfly because it has all these little um, cocoons of a wasp on it. Um, these are the, the pupating cocoons of a parasitic wasp. So Although these look like bees, they will not sting you because they're butterflies. Um, here's a skipper that sometimes you'll see Oops. on there. Let's see what else we got. A little wood satyr. So if you have a lot of um, orchard grass, if you've got an orchard with orchard grass in it, um, the adults feed on tree sap and honeydew. So you'll see them up in the trees usually if you're looking for those. Now here's the monarch. Um, looks kind of like um, the swallowtail butterfly but it only feeds on the butterfly milkweeds, the dog banes, and, and the butterfly weeds. And again, there's no um, bar across those hind wings on there um, for the monarchs. Uh, the morning cloak, you'll see these usually overwintering as, um, maybe overwinter as adults because they come out pretty early. Um, tree sap of oak, it has to be oak tree sap and rotting fruit. So if you you see some of those, they're beautiful, beautiful butterflies. Um, although the larvae are hard to find sometimes. The Northern Metal Mark, um, and it's the name for this little metal gray, shiny part around the outside edge. Um, this one's pretty indiscriminate feeders. It really likes any kind of daisy type flower. The Orange Sulfur, very similar to um, the Yellow Sulfur on that one. Uh, the pearl crescent is pretty common. It loves the larval host plants will eat the asters. Um, and then the adults will also feed the asters, the swamp milkweed and the thistles um, for us. And the pipe vine swallowtail is pipe vines. So if you don't have a pipe vine, you don't have the swallowtails on there. Um, but this will, the adults will feed on a lot of different flowers. Elm hop and nettles for the red admiral. You can see this one a lot of the time. This one likes bird droppings. I'm not sure how it finds it, but it does. Um, red spotted purples. These are easy to find. I love them because they're this blue color. I like the blue of the um, edge of the wings. And this, again, kind of looks like a little bit of a piece of bark <laughs> or a bird dropping on a leaf. Um, very easy to find those. Um, the silver spotted skipper. There's a big silver spot. That one's pretty common. Sphinx moths. Oh, those can be fairly uh, fairly large, um, those butterflies and moths. 
but um, the ones that have these little white cocoons, like I said earlier, are pretty much dead men walk in. This one happens to be a tomato hornworm. Um, so I would leave that one on there. It's just a zombie, it's a mummy. It's not feeding anymore. So it needs to hatch out all those little wasps for those. So I'm kind of torn. Do you leave the parasites on there? Do you, or you destroy those too? Um, but the sphinx moths can be pretty quick, pretty large. Here's spice bush swallowtail. So it, it feeds on sassafras and spice bush and magnolia. Um, can be quite large. There's also a green, oops, goodness. Can be a green um, larvae also. Here's the tawny emperor, which is our last little butterfly of this time. And I, I like this one because it's little um, antennae are kind of, um, you know, they're kind of alien looking. They're little spikies instead of being a little um, 